So, uh, so it occurred to me this morning, actually, that, and only this morning, which you know is not a great, uh, not the most auspicious beginning, uh, that I'm going to talk about a couple of libraries whose lead developers are here. Uh, so, if this is awesome, it's because they're brilliant, and if this still makes no sense by the time I'm done, it's my fault. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I want to talk about. Uh, as, as the description says uh, on the website, a lot of us still have to write basic CRUD REST APIs. We take JSON, we store it in a database, we look it up in a database, a SQL database, not even some fancy schmancy new thing. Uh, and we need to get it back out. And does purely functional programming have anything to say about helping us accomplish that goal? And, and for that matter, what is the goal? What is sort of the point of purely functional programming in the first place. Um, and uh, can we discuss that without um, going too deeply into some of the more uh, abstract theoretical terminology around these subjects? Uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, there have been and continue to be great presentations about those right here, um, especially today. Uh, and I'll uh, mention some of them a bit later. But first of all, let's just start off by talking about good old HTTP. And first of all, I have to apologize. I intended to do this live um, and unfortunately ran into some issues uh, with the tool set that I was using. So throughout the entire presentation, please keep in mind that you can type all of this into a REPL, um, actually. Uh, and that's, that's very much part of the point, uh, is that I, I want I want to emphasize and I want everyone to keep in mind that you can be at your keyboard typing this in interactively. You do not have to have this sort of compile deploy cycle. Um, that's actually one of, the, one of the advantages that I want to sort of call out. But, but the first thing we need to talk about is what is an HTTP service? And the most fundamental intuition, the simplest intuition, the one that I want you all to keep in mind every time you think HTTP service is as simple as this. It's a function, if you're a Scala programmer, that's a perfectly fine function signature, right? Um, an HTTP service takes a request and returns a response at the end of the day, somehow. Um, there are a lot of details that need to be explained about the request and there are a lot of details that need to be explained about the response, but ultimately that is what an HTTP service is. It's a function that takes a request to a response. So keep that firmly in mind because we're never going to deviate very far uh, from that intuition uh, as, we, as we develop a service, as we develop a, a REST uh, service. But let me quote my good friend and former colleague Runar Bjarnason, don't lie with your types, okay? If you're a Scala developer, you might already have some ideas about how this signature isn't exactly honest, right? It isn't exactly, it is lying um, if you're actually developing an HTTP service. For example, um, first of all, there can be some problem with what your service does in terms of talking to some other service on the network. It can fail and this thing can throw an exception or something like that. Or you could try to parse the JSON, you're expecting JSON uh, in the request. There might not be JSON in the request. There might not be anything in the request. Um, so you can fail to parse what's in the request uh, and have to return, hopefully, you're still gonna return a response. Um, you're gonna return an appropriate response. But that's something that you have to keep in mind. So there are some, there are some constraints. Uh, there are some respects in which this signature lies. Also, the signature doesn't say anything about effects. Right? It just, this signature claims that you just take a request and transform it to a response, do some bit manipulation and, and return the response. And that's almost never true, especially if you have to talk to a database somewhere in the middle. So this is naive. This is, this is a little bit of a naive model and we need to elaborate on it ever so slightly. Um, so what do I have here? The world's simplest service, right? Forgive me, I'm visually impaired. I have to sort of lean over and stare at my own slides. Um, <clears throat> so using the HTTP for S library, we can very quickly and very easily develop a complete HTTP service. 
Uh, and in fact, there's a type called HTTP route, so that actually does this elaboration that I just described around that function signature. It is just a function, right? Uh, in this case, it's a case expression reflecting the fact that we might want to do pattern matching on the request. But it takes the request and it returns, in this case, a response that the DSL we've imported lets us build from just a status. So um, no content is a status, I forget what it is, 204, something like that. But this is in fact a complete HTTP service, boom, done, right? It's, it's simple to the point of uselessness, um, but it is in fact a complete HTTP, HTTP service. And I wanna emphasize that because here we have the manifestation in HTTP for us of the slightly elaborated version of the signature that we just saw. It's just a function. It takes a request, it transforms it to a response, and we're done. Okay, uh, what, what's, what's one of the nice things about just having a function? One of the nice things about just having a function is just plain old functions are easy to test. And here we have an example where I say, um, you know, given, given an incoming request, actually I build a, um, yeah, given, given an incoming request, let me run this function over it. Uh, and here I'm actually taking advantage of, again, a little bit of the elaboration that HTTP for us gives us for free with this or not found. Um, and I'll explain more why that's necessary and actually cool um, in just a few minutes. But anyway, here's just a little bit of machinery. Here's a little bit of syntax, you know, for comprehension around this elaborated function that is our service. And then we get a response back from our function and then because we're actually returning this response in, okay, I'm gonna use the word, right? Monad, right? Effect monad. Uh, we need to actually run the monad in order to get the result and, and we would get the result which is, you know, a response that says not found. Not very interesting, but it does underscore the fact that this is just a function and we can invoke the function with a little bit of syntactic um, overhead. But actually, to me, it's just a little, it's a little bit too much uh, syntactic overhead. Uh, so one of the things that HTTP for us gives us out of the box is also a client. You have both an H HTTP service and an HTTP client library. So one of the cool things you can do, especially given that an HTTP service is, say it again, just a function, uh, is you can construct the client from the HTTP service. You can, it's basically function composition under the hood. So you can say, hey client, construct one of yourself from this HTTP, HTTP service, and then you can build the request and, and submit it uh, just as you would to a real service somewhere on the network. Uh, and that makes testing even, even less noisy. And I'm still not happy with that. So still too much work. So here is, I think, the most compact, straightforward, simple um, leveraging of the fact that you can build a client from a service, submit a request to it. Again, we're taking advantage of some, some DSLs that HTTP for us provides. And this is just a dirt simple way to simply write a function that is an HTTP service and then test it by constructing a client from it and submitting a request to it and seeing what you get. Okay. But a, a no content response is not very interesting and ignoring the request is not very interesting. So here we have what I call the lamest echo service ever, right? Uh, it actually does some pattern matching on the request to say, you know, is it a post? Is it a post to the user endpoint? And if it is a post to the user endpoint, I want, to, uh, I want to parse the incoming JSON into a case class, and in this case, all I'm doing is I'm just returning what I get, like I said, the world's lamest uh, echo service. But there are some interesting things uh, that hopefully warrant the claim that it's easy to use purely functional programming in HTTP for S and CRC to do JSON REST services. First of all, as you can see, I have some imports here that basically say, I want to automatically derive the encoder and decoder for my case class uh, to and from JSON. That's a little controversial. Uh, you know, some people feel very strongly about having some sort of other descriptor uh, for the things that you're going to be serializing and deserializing, and you shouldn't use automatic derivation. 
Uh, that's a conversation for another day. You can do it, I would argue, if you're only doing it for internal types between your microservices, for example. Um, that's a justifiable uh, use for automatic derivation. I did have to say uh, JSON encoder, uh, or sorry, JSON of uh, here, in order to make the, uh, the encoder visible to HTTP4S. So I have a, I have a JSON encoder and, and decoder, which knows nothing about HTTP. And then I need the uh, JSON of to say, hey, uh, you know, HTTP, here's what's called an entity encoder. Uh, so this can be a body of an HTTP uh, request or response. And that's what that's for. Now there's al already some interesting things going on here in just, in just a few lines of code that I, I kind of want to call out. Uh, one of them is this as, you know, this as business where we take the request and we say it's, it should be a user, right? And the operative phrase there is should be because this operation can fail, right? How can it fail? There are quite a few failure modes here. Uh, some of the obvious ones are the, uh, the content type might not even be application slash JSON, right? Uh, you might not have valid JSON. It might not even parse. The JSON parser might choke on it. It might be valid JSON, but it might not actually parse into this user case class, so, so the encoder could actually fail. Um, all of this is subsumed by this as operator. What you get from the as operator is, once again, a monad. <laughs> Sorry, there's, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, the monad in question here is the cat's IO uh, effect monad. And one of the things that I think we don't talk about enough when we talk about monads, especially uh, effect monads, is the fact that most of them are failure monads. They, they model failure as well as having some effect like talking to the network or you know, talking to the disk or what have you. Um, they also model failure. Uh, so that's also why I map over, in the last line, I map over this result um, before returning it, hopefully with an okay status, because it's just like mapping over an option, you know, when you have a value that might or might not exist. Same thing, except here it's a more general notion of you may have succeeded or you may not. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that HTTP for us here uh, if the I.O. has failed, that failure will propagate out and you won't actually return an OK. This, this looks like you're always going to return OK. That's not true. Um, if any of the aforementioned things fail, then HTTP for us will happily automatically return a status 500 uh, for you instead of the OK. So OK here is a little um, aspirational. Yeah. Um, this, this can fail, you know, it's, it's a naive echo service, but it can fail in multiple ways, and HTTP for us will do the right thing with, with this simple code. So one of the things I really want to emphasize throughout this discussion is just code the happy path. And, and when we talk about monads and error monads in particular, one of the things that's really worth emphasizing is their fail fast. So the first thing that fails here is what the response is actually going to reflect. So for example, if the request header, uh, content type header, is not application JSON, it's not even going to bother trying to parse the body, right? It's, it already knows it's not JSON, sorry. Um, so that, that error will propagate all the way out to the response automatically. OK, well, parsing JSON converting it into a case class, returning it, I mean, okay, great, lovely. Um, but what if we actually have to do something, you know, with the data, like store it in a database or query it from a database? This is some, some code using uh, the wonderful Doobie library for talking to J JDBC databases. Uh, thanks to Rob Norris, one of the two lead developers. Uh, Ross Baker is the lead developer of HTTP for us. So both of those gentlemen are here. Uh, anyway, here's just some plain old SQL, right? One of the things I really, really appreciate about Doobie is that it doesn't hide the SQL from you. Um, far from it. Uh, and in fact, here, here we are, yeah, right, for better or for worse, right? Depends upon how you feel about SQL. Uh, but here we have some just plain old SQL queries uh, against the database for our user. And again, some of the things I want to point out are there's this really nice SQL interpolator so that you can just write what looks like a string, but it's actually not. 
uh, this actually gets compiled down to a, um, I forget what the JDBC term is, but, sorry? Yes, prepared statement, thank you. Um, and it is actually type safe. Um, if you screw up the types of these interpolated values here with respect to the types in the case class that they refer to, this won't compile. So there's a certain amount of protecting you from yourself that is also one of the things that I like about typed functional programming, you know, something I really appreciate. The other thing I need to talk about here is um, describing what you expect in your result. So for example, um, when you get all users, you'll notice that I ask for a stream. And uh, I think the other one is, yeah, looking up a specific user by ID and that, re potential, that returns an option that user might or might not exist, right? So we need to call that out. Also, um, this all ultimately happens against this thing called a transactor. The transactor just mediates the connection to the database. It owns the connection to the database. Um, and it's what you actually do a transaction with, which is reflected in these, uh, in these lines down at the bottom here. Transact against the transactor. And then do something uh, hopefully uh, helpful with the data. So for example, when you insert something, you want, kind of want to get the ID back. Um, so we copy the, the uh, user and, and uh, make sure that the copy has the ID that was generated when we inserted it. Uh, or what's the other thing that we, that we do uh, with create user? Yeah, we specify that we're going to want the ID back, right? When, when we, we're going to generate the ID and we're going to get that back from the query. Okay. And I think another important thing to call out here is that notice that there's nothing about JSON or HTTP in here. This is just the SQL stuff. It's completely standalone, it's completely isolated. You can test it in isolation, you can play with it in the REPL, you can do all that stuff, completely apart from, from HTTP. Great separation of concerns, right? Okay, so now, I apologize for the lack of white space here, but this all does fit in one slide. So here what I've done is I've actually integrated, you know, imagine that this DB here is an instance of that class we just saw, right? So now we've actually integrated the interaction with the database into a couple of uh, paths in our HTTP service, doing exactly the same JSON manipulation that we did before, uh, but now we're actually inserting into the database and we're returning results in, in the response and, and we have the create and the, the lookup of all the users and, and so on and so forth. And this is actually a complete service, obviously, right? It's, it's taking JSON, it's inserting it into the database, or it's taking, an, uh, it's, it's taking a request to get all the users and it's looking all the users up in the database and it's re returning them to the client in a very, very, very small amount of code that fits on one slide. And again, notice what I haven't written. I haven't said a word about content types. I haven't said a word about how many results there might or might not be when I ask for all the users. It could be zero, it could be a million, who knows, right? By the way, that's probably a little scary, right? When I have shown code to this to colleagues at uh, previous employers, the immediate feedback has been that's just dangerously naive, right? Just ridiculously dangerously naive. It's, it's like it doesn't, it doesn't handle, it doesn't, you know, what happens when you have 10 million users? and all that kind of sort of thing. It, what happens when the connection to the database fails? What happened, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the answer is, it does the right thing. In particular, I, I want to call out that when we ask for all the users, if there are a million of them, that's fine because we're actually getting an FS2 stream. You might have seen the Scala Z stream reboot presentation earlier. You might have heard of FS2 at previous, um, previous events. We actually get an FS2 stream of users from the database, and HTTP for us automatically turns an FS2 stream into a chunked encoded response. We don't have to do that ourselves. So this actually works in constant memory, and it doesn't matter how many rows there are in the user table in the database, those all get chunked out um, to, the, to the client by this service. This is, strictly speaking, this is all we have to do to write a JSON REST API that talks to a SQL database. There's really not much more to add. Now, 
that might lead you to believe that HTTP for us is very opinionated, right? There's only one way to do things. And that's actually not true because it is built on top of CATS and FS2. So for example, if you wanted to hop in the middle and do something different uh, you know, with any of these IO monads that could fail, for example, you might want to say handle error with right there in the middle in case you needed to do some custom error handling. You totally can do that. Um, if you wanted to, uh, oh, I should, I should talk a little bit about what's going on with this, with this transformation on the, on the request all the users thing. Um, because we actually get back a stream of users from the database, we need to jump through a couple more hoops to return that as a JSON array. So that's, that's what we do. What's a JSON array? We emit the square bracket and then we, we iterate over the stream of users. We convert those to JSON, we convert that to ASCII and stick a comma between them. That's, that intersperse operator comes from FS2 and it's nice. It just says put this between every element of the stream as they come from the stream. And then we emit the closing square bracket. So that generates a legal JSON array from a stream of whatever, in this case a stream of users. And because we are constructing the text sort of manually, then we do have to call out that, yeah, this is still application JSON. Please, when you send the response back, make sure the content type is, is application JSON. But this actually works, and it works no matter how many users there are in the database, and um, you know, it, just, it does the right thing by default if your definition of the right thing, for example, is return a status 500 if the network goes kerflui. Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk about another really cool thing about the fact that HTTP for us models services as functions. There's a dual relationship with client. If you might have heard Greg File talk about duality uh, in an earlier presentation, this is one of my favorite things to do with this. Not only can we construct an HTTP for us client from a service, but given an HTTP for us client, we can also turn it into a service. They have a dual relationship. It can go either way. And that's awesome because if I'm working in a microservice environment and some other team somewhere else in the organization is not quite done with some service that I depend on and I need to mock out some functionality of that other team's service, this is actually all it takes. I, if I'm using the HTTP first client to talk to that service over there, then I can turn that client into a service I can stick a little mock service in front of it with this TIE Fighter operator, and that's another one of those funky functional programming things because what that means is I can do that because an HTTP service is a semi-group K, and that's, the, that's addition, okay? Let's just call that addition, even with the TIE Fighter thing. You can add two HTTP services together. It means exactly what you think it means. Let the first one take a crack at the request. If it doesn't handle it, let the next one take a crack at it. So if I've got another team's incomplete service out there that I'm, I've got my client to, I can turn it into a service, I can put my mock service in front of it, and then turn it back into a client, right? So now request to that client, go to my mock service first. If that mock service doesn't handle it, they go off actually and hit the network and go off to this other service. And then as that other team implements more and more functionality, uh, I can take more and more functionality out of my mock service until I can remove my mock service completely and not do this um, client transformation at all. But that two lines there is all it takes to do that. Okay, actually serving stuff. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm really disappointed that I wasn't actually able to do all this in the REPL as I had originally intended because it would have, again, underscored the fact that I have not actually run a server, <laughs> right? These are all just functions. The HTTP service is a function, the client is a function, everything is a function. But at some point, at the end of the day, you actually do have to, uh, presume, you want to actually run a server. Uh, nice thing about HTTP for us, something that I know Ross is very proud of especially, is that, yeah, you can run it in a servlet container, if you're in an environment where that's still necessary, corporate environment, for example, where that's still necessary. Um, there's the Blaze uh, NIO2 implementation that uh, a lot of people like to use when they're able to be in a completely self-contained environment, very high performance, ridiculously high performance. 
and specific Tomcat and uh, Jetty uh, implementations as well. The ecosystem is pretty amazing. Uh, CRC is not the only supported JSON library. Practically all the popular JSON libraries are supported. You have a couple of different metrics packages with uh, Drop Wizard and Prometheus. Let me see what else. Oh yeah, XML support because that actually is still a thing, believe it or not. Uh, Scala tags and twirl templates for in case you don't just want a REST service but you actually have to generate some HTML and, and ship that back. Uh, all sorts of great resources about both HTTP for REST and Doobie. Um, first of all, Ross's presentation is, is at the top of the list and, um, and Rob Norris has, has done a couple of really awesome presentations about Doobie and uh, especially about how types work in, in that context. Uh, you know, doing straight, uh, straight SQL but in a strongly typed way uh, with, uh, with Doobie. And uh, I wanted to leave plenty of time, which I think I have, um, for a Q&A. Um, so thank you for coming. Probably hang on to the mic. Could, could you switch back on the resources, please? Back to resources. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Any questions? Um, what's your take on uh, uh, the standard web service frameworks that uh, like Scala Cloud or Play framework that have been developed to build web services? Uh, as opposed to, you know, on the cool uh, stuff that comes out of the box, or mm -hmm. not out of the box, but just, uh, yeah. you know, just ecosystems right. that they drop on you. Yeah. So, so the, question, the question is sort of my take on some of the other uh, more popular, possibly, uh, frameworks in the Scala ecosystem like Scalatra and Play. These are, these are great uh, tools that, are, are, that were developed along a different set of, of principles. Um, you know, Play is obviously the standard offering from Lightbend and has evolved quite a bit since its inception. So for example, it started off as a um, sort of a full stack application platform very strongly oriented around the traditional sort of templating and uh, you know end-to-end -end generation and handling of, of the whole, um, you know, before the advent of REST APIs really and, and um, single page applications and so on and so forth. It's evolved to support all of that much, much, much better. Uh, and of course, it's also evolved as the underlying uh, infrastructure such as Akka and Akka HTTP um, have also. So it's gotten much more modular and it's gotten, in my mind, much more appropriate to tackle some of the same things that you would use HTTP 4S and, and CRC for and, and, um, and Doobie. It's not purely functional um, and that is without going off on a very, very large tangent there, um, I'm committed to doing purely functional programming, whether it's in Scala or Haskell or whatever, I feel less strongly about that. But the reason is that um, <clears throat> the, the ability to do local um, algebraic reasoning about my code is the best way I know to write high quality code. Um, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize throughout this is that I've only coded up the happy path and that's all I need to code up by default. Um, that's extraordinarily unusual. You, you didn't see any try catch blocks, you didn't see any sort of if this then that, then you, know, you didn't see any sort of weird sort of control flow. You saw some, <clears throat> you saw some maps and you saw some for comprehensions, right? You saw as give me a user from this JSON that comes in from this request, done. That can fail, that is captured by the IO monad, and then I just map over the IO monad or you know, whatever, or, or I can try to construct a re uh, response uh, using, by just saying okay, but I, just, I say okay around an IO of something or a stream of something, an FS2 stream of something, and that just works. It does the right thing, I don't have to sweat whether that stream is in a failed state or that IO is in a failed state, did the JSON parse correctly, is the header correct, I don't, I don't have to care. And all of these concerns are covered by the standard machinery of 
purely functional programming in Scala with the CATS ecosystem. That's not true of the other platforms. Any more questions? How much of that is an artifact of just like nice frameworks that have error handling better in them versus like what functional programming brings to the table? Yeah, what's the, what's the difference between carefully designed APIs in a non-purely functional context, right, versus um, being in a purely functional context? Great question. Yeah, you, if you look at some of these other tools, if you look at some of these other platforms, you can see results that, at least syntactically, are very similar um, to this. The difference, I would say, is that in this context, you can continue to expand this use of failure monads and effect monads out and integrate more and more larger and larger, increasingly complex um, components of your application in exactly the same way that the rest of this works. So uh, the way that I like to characterize this is <clears throat> I like to call it fractal understanding. Um, I can zoom in to any expression in any of these slides, a single expression, and say, okay, I understand completely how this works. And when I say completely, I do in fact mean I can reason about this using the monad laws or the applicative laws or all that sort of stuff. I didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to avoid talking about that in this presentation. Um, but I do, in fact, day to day, rely on my ability to zoom in to any level of detail in the code and say with at least four and preferably five nines um, assurance. I know what this code is going to do before I run it. Um, and I can zoom out to any uh, greater level of granularity that I want, including the entire program, and say exactly the same thing using the exact same reasoning tools. Um, that's also not true of the other platforms. Do you think it's possible, or if so how, um, to build something like this in a purely functional context uh, when you are collaborating with a bunch of junior developers who don't have that fractal understanding? Um, it's, it's certainly harder. Uh, and, and here's, you know, if I'm going to get company political at all, I guess this is where I do it. Um, I, I, think, I think as an industry, um, I'm going to say the technical term is we suck at internal education. Um, we, we insist on either hiring cheap labor, um, who we then expect to basically sit at their desk and grind out code and, and go home at the end of the day. And if the end of the day is 8, 9 o'clock, so be it. Um, and the seniors or the architects who, at some, some, by some magical unicorn process, um, have achieved mastery of these kinds of things and they're responsible for, you know, this sort of stuff. I've been very fortunate in my career, I have to say, um, to have worked for organizations like Intel Media, like Verizon Labs, like Formation, um, where the commitment to internal education has been manifest. Um, but intellectual honesty requires me to, to admit that there is a learning curve around all of this. And the, the great thing now is, my gosh, there are, you know, we had the Red Book signing here earlier, that's awesome. Uh, Sam Halliday has written uh, Functional Programming for Mortals. Um, we have the Architecture Astronauts, or sorry, the, the Type Astronauts Guide to Shapeless. So there's less and less excuse from a resources perspective um, not to learn this sort of stuff. Um, and, and, Frankly, my major goal here is to pull back from talking about things like monads and semi-group K, even though I kind of had to mention both of those, um, but to sort of pull back from the type theory, pull back from the category theory, um, just to emphasize that this is just a function. The service is just a function. You can sit there and type it into your REPL and pass an argument to it and get a result back. That's what a function is. We, we, and I'm as guilty as the next guy. We've mystified functional, pure functional programming so much, and I'm trying to help. 
Great question. Um, the stream story path, to what extent is that a blocking API? Right. You keep emphasizing it's just a function, but I mean, but how difficult would it be to extend this for asynchronous CMIT? Right. Yeah, good question. Uh, well, first of all, two, two answers to that. One, you're absolutely right, JDBC is blocking, right? So one of the things I didn't talk about here and should have uh, is how you would actually shift execution of the database interaction code to another thread pool. Um, and there's, uh, there is an answer to that in the, um, in the cat's effect uh, context. Uh, and in fact, it's called context shift. Um, I, didn't, I didn't show that here. It would add a few lines to the code, wouldn't fit on a slide, but it is important to actually do in practice. Um, the additional comment I'll make is please don't use the global execution context. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fixed thread pool with however many CPUs your box ha has and you will starve threads if you use that to talk to JDBC. So um, check out another library by another friend and former colleague of mine, Chris Davenport. Uh, there's a library called Linebacker um, that uh, helps you manage your thread pools, construct uh, context shifts for them, and uh, send the work where it's appropriate to send the work. Great. Any more questions? We do have time for one more if there is. Great. Uh, thanks for, for, for the talk and one more Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.